Oh, here we are. Yeah, here oh. we go. Okay. Is the camera going to follow me? No, it's on me right now. There they go. Okay. <laughs> okay, welcome. My name is Jennifer Dill. I'm a faculty member in the School of Urban Studies and Planning. And along with Rob Bertini and Chris Monsoon, my colleagues, we help organize um, this Friday afternoon seminar on transportation. And this is our last of the academic year. And um, I want to remind folks who have not been here before that we are webcast um, both live and archived. So we ask that if you ask a question of the speaker to please use the microphone in front of you holding down um, on the touch thing, keeping the red light on while you're speaking. Um, and we actually do have people who watch us on the web. So we aren't doing this just for not. Um, <laughs> so anyway, <laughs> without further ado, uh, I want to introduce Carolyn Bonner, who is one of our Masters in Urban Regional Planning students, um, who is just finishing up and who's actually going to go on to get her Masters in Civil Engineering here as well. And so I will let her, the topic is there, and I'll let you go. Great. Thanks, Jennifer. So thanks, everyone, for coming. Um, today I am going to talk about my field area paper research to date. So these are just the initial findings of um, the topic that I chose to look at for my field area paper was um, what is happening in small cities across the nation with regard to transit and what would be good models uh, for development of a transit system in the city of Bend, which is here in Oregon. Um, so I want to talk a little bit, I'm going to introduce my project, tell you about my research question, um, go over my methodology and my background, and then talk a little bit more about the, what my literature review found in terms of what our indicators of good and successful transit systems, then talk about my findings to date and initial conclusions, and then the further study section is actually an audience participation part because, um, as I said, it's just my initial findings, and I'd love to hear from you guys about what I can do next to try to figure out what's going on um, with small city transit, transit in small cities. So what I wanted to find out um, was what would be the most effective um, type of transit system or elements of transit systems that could be um, implemented in the city of Bend. Um, to do that, I wanted to look first to see what does uh, transit in small urban areas across the nation look like. And what I found was this was actually kind of a hard question to answer. Um, there's not a whole lot of research that's been done on transit in small cities, um, primarily, I think, because it doesn't make a whole not a whole lot of people take transit in small cities, and it doesn't. Um, it also doesn't make up for a whole lot of the transit ridership across the nation. So then I wanted to say, well, what would be some good models or good cities that would provide models that would work in Bend? And then what specifically are the elements of those systems that could um, be incorporated into a system for Bend? And I think the, an important thing to reiterate here is that I was not developing a service plan for transit in Bend. I'm going to leave that to the officials of the city of Bend to do. But what I wanted to find was, are there things going on in other cities similar size to Bend that could be possibly incorporated into a system for Bend? So first, my methodology. I uh, had to go out and figure out what's going on with public transit and what's going on in the city of Bend. Then I did a pretty big literature review on um, what's going on with transit across the nation and what are some of the performance measures that indicate uh, if it's a good transit system. Uh, next was my selection of comparable cities, and this is actually part that I'm kind of most proud of for this project, how I actually went about deciding which cities to look at, and then it was my data collection. Um, for the data collection for this paper, I really only looked at secondary sources, so I didn't spend any time emailing or on the phone with officials in these cities to ask about transit, so I was just using already documented or already published material. So these are the things I'm going to talk about, these specific four things when I talk about my background research. The city of Bend. Um, this is it's the largest city east of the Cascade Mountains here in Oregon. So um, we, a lot of times when we talk about Oregon, we tend to get stuck in the Willamette Valley and forget that there's this whole part of the state east of the Cascade Mountains. Um, but Bend is the largest city there. It's about 25 square miles. Um, and it's growing pretty rapidly. Um, so here's Bend in Deschutes County, and then here is the city of Bend. Um, I think the 
what people have been, alar I guess the growth rate in Bend is somewhat alarming. Um, the, between just the first couple years after the census, they've had like this 19% growth rate. Um, if you compare that for the same year as the city of Portland, we've had about a 3% growth rate. And pe people think that Portland is growing fast. And so then you look at 19% and that's really big. Um, and it is predicted to continue to grow. Um, and by the year 2010, they'll have a city almost twice its size. So just a little bit about Bend. Um, the primary industry in Bend at this point is they have the hospital there, so that does employ a lot of people. It's a huge service sector industry. I mean, you can imagine when a city is growing at a, at a really high rate um, that there's a lot of building going on. There's actually a lot of high-end construction going on. So everyone is there to serve the people who are moving to Bend, whether it be florists or hairdressers or um, any other kind of service sector you can think of. Um, the median income is still only at about 40000 a year, and the per capita income is about 20000 a year. Um, so they haven't, although they're growing so fast, their incomes are kind of really not as, not super high. Um, interesting, though, people imagine Bend is, it's, has been listed in Fortune magazine or different magazines for being a great place for retirees. Um, there's per capita, I think there are more golf courses than most cities probably competing with cities in Arizona in terms of the number of golf courses. Um, and uh, so people imagine it being a place where retirees come, build their second homes or their home they're going to retire in. But actually the median age in Bend is about 35 people, or 35, age 35. <laughs> um, so it is actually attracting younger people and younger families. Um, and what's interesting, though, is that it is a pretty wealthy community. People who are coming are coming from places in California, so this is their, uh, they think it's really inexpensive to live in Oregon versus California, and so we have kind of traditional people who normally drive, um, they have several, several households have several cars, and it's not um, really people who have said, oh, I'm moving from Chicago, I drove, tra I took transit there and I want to take it in Bend, um, it tends to be an auto-oriented culture. Um, so only about 5% of the households don't have a car, and only about 10% of the households are actually living below poverty. Um, and you can see here from the pictures that we have a kind of a variety of land uses in Bend. The new construction in the center, which actually looks a little bit more urban. Um, the picture on the down right corner is looking at some of the retail we have, but then you can also see that we do have some big box development. So um, some of the land uses there are conducive to, tra to transit ridership and others really aren't. Um, but the city is working to think about how they can increase their densities throughout the city and also um, how we can incorporate more industrial and manufacturing jobs in Bend. But the city of Bend was designated as an MPO in 2002, and this is a big thing because it means that they have to really think about urbanizing, and they have to be intentional about um, their transportation planning in an urbanizing area. Um, the city has, uh, one of the things I found out when I was doing MP research on MPOs was that the Board membership actually does represent some of the regional priorities. And here we can see that the board membership for the MPO board was actually three from the city, one from the county, and one from the state. And the transit interest is actually represented by the city of Bend um, because that's who uh, runs their transit right now. The existing transit in Bend. So we have a city that's growing at a 19% rate and they have no fixed route transit. Um, there's been recent articles that have been all over the place, I guess, at the beginning of this year about how Bend is the largest city west of the Mississippi with no fixed route transit. Um, they actually didn't have general public transit until January of 2002. So this is kind of, you know, is it a crisis? I don't know. I mean, some people would say that this is something that, that is a problem, that we have a city that's a uh, large urban area, it's the largest urban area for miles around, and there's no fixed route transit. Um, can talk to people in Bend who you would think wouldn't really care about if there's transit or not, from mechanics to people in the service industry, and they're saying, Where? Why don't we have a bus here? You know, we have this dialogue service, but isn't that for old people? You know, there's not, so there's this kind of missing link. Um, but at the same time, um, the mode split. You know, it's so small, uh, probably because the service isn't so good, but it's not a whole, we don't know if people would ride or not. So what is the role of transit in the United States? I think that this is kind of important to realize. I, um, 
when I was looking to see what do we even do about transit, we had to say, what's going on all across the nation? And as we know that transit is not, a, we don't have a whole bunch of riders. Um, it's actually falling. And one of the things I looked at was that um, not just is transit ridership kind of decreasing compared to uh, people who are driving alone to work, but there are fewer people who are walking, who are walking and biking also. So, um, so we also know that most of the use is happening in big urban areas. So New York City, Chicago, San Francisco, these are the places where most people are riding transit. And such a small percentage of any kind of ridership is happening in areas outside those large ones. And that's one of the reasons, as I said before, that we don't have a whole lot of research on it. But even if people aren't riding transit to work, we know that transit serves all these other goals. And this is what I think needs to be the priority for, and is the priority in smaller cities. Uh, so we know that transit can serve elderly and disabled because these are people who are less likely to be able to drive their cars, especially cars for a small distance. We know that college students ride transit. Um, they tend to not have a whole bunch of money and tend to be more willing, and they have more time than they have money. So they're willing to take longer trips if it's cheaper. Um, and they're also not in a position to, they're more liberal and tend to take transit. We know that youth, people who can't drive, are definitely people who need to, a transit service. And then in a place like Bend, where you do have huge tourist and recreation visitors or industries, um, it would definitely be a great opportunity for people to, or a great service for people who are coming to Bend for these reasons. And then just in general, we, transit is a way to just provide um, transit options for everyone. So even if you're not taking transit every day, the, you know that if your car breaks down, you can jump on the bus to come home. Or if you need to drop your car off uh, at the mechanic, there's a way to get home or a way to go pick it up. So a little bit about metropolitan planning organizations. Um, MPOs, so the federal government designates cities that get to be bigger than 50,000 as MPOs. And this is important because the MP MPO requires that a city do coordinated transportation planning and to start to come up with some comprehensive and long-term transportation goals for the region. Um, and it was actually in 1973 that that was uh, when it was created for that requirement. The MPO serves five core functions. Uh, they are there to, as it says, establish the setting, but the MPO is designated and then all of us, it provides an opportunity for this, whether it's the city or the state or the county, anyone who's interested in transportation in the region to start coming together and someone to say, no, the federal government says we have to start talking, um, we have to start coming together. Um, to evaluate alternatives, it's in, the MPO requires that um, just adding lanes to roads can't be the only solution to congestion or the only way to move people from one area to the other. It says we have to look at different modes, we have to look at different land use solutions. Um, they have to create the long term plan and also develop a transportation improvement plan which prioritizes how we're going to improve the system as the years go on. And finally to involve the public. For us here in Oregon, this might not be such a radical idea, but across the nation in 1973, the thought of involving the public in transportation decisions was not something that was very common. And so when the federal government said that cities needed to do this, they had transportation officials across the nation had to radically change how they were planning their transportation um, systems. And then the, every MPO has to develop some long-range plans. And the Unified Working Plan Planning Work Program um, actually says how it talks about how the cities are going to coordinate to get these things done. And it's really important because, as we know, no one agency or one person owns and manages the entire transportation system. And so um, when you're a small city, it's easy to kind of pretend that this is how it goes and you can just kind of manage your city streets and, or your state highway. But once you get a lot of traffic on those roads, you really need to think about how the whole system works together. And the MPO says from an agency perspective that we're going to do this. Um, between 1973 and then 1991, there were some big changes in terms of how MPOs operated. And originally, as I said, they had to start coordinating. But ICE-T in 1991 and then reiterated again in 98 with T-21, um, changed how funding is happening for transportation projects, which actually allowed more money 
So it's great if the federal government was saying you have to think about a bunch of different modes, but if they're not giving anybody money to think about how we're going to plan for these modes, it's a great idea, but it's hard to have it happen. Um, and so they, it changed how the funding happened, so it allowed money from the Highway Trust Fund to actually be used for transit and other types of, project, uh, other types of projects. And it also allocated general funds to um, MPOs for their transportation planning. And ICE-T, and then again reiterated with T21, changed what the planning objectives, what the planning priorities were for these cities. And number one, mobility and access for the people. And with the ICE-T legislation actually said, you have to look at enhancing and improving your transit system and the use of that system. And so the federal government was explicitly saying to these cities, small as they may be at 50,000, you need to start thinking about transit and, and walking and biking and the environment and all these different things. Um, but for my study, it was really important for me to see that, yes, once you become an MPO, you do need to think about how transit is going to um, impact your transportation system. But in Oregon, we have even stronger rules that say we need to be thinking about different modes, and that's the transportation planning rule. This was adopted at the same time that ICE-T was. So I think Oregon said, okay, the federal government's going to do this. Well, we're going to go one step stronger, and we're going to say that not only do our MPOs have to do some coordinated planning, but all of our cities do. And so this actually works well for Bend because they have been thinking about a transportation systems plan for a while. Um, but they haven't necessarily had any specific funding to back it up. But with the MPO, they do have some more money to do that. Um, but the TSP also specifically requires that cities look at how they can reduce the, the rate of VMT um, in their cities. It looks at how in their downtown or across their city they're going to reduce the number of parking spaces. We know that there's a direct relationship between the number of parking spaces, the fact that they're free, and how often people drive. Um, and then finally, they out, the transportation planning rule also says that cities need to look at land use as a solution to some of the transport, some of the transportation problems. So the next part of my research really looked, may have been actually the first part, but it sort of went throughout, was what are the factors that um, influence whether or not transit is, is successful or not in a city. Um, I really originally started out saying, okay, there's got to be some performance measures out there. It'll just tell me what's, if it's a good transit system or if it's not. And what I found was it wasn't that simple. Um, there are some imposed trans standard performance measures which come from the national government that talk about how much it costs an agency to move uh, different riders and how much money they spend on their buses and these types of things. But there are these internal and external factors that really the research has shown for over the last 30 years really impact the use of transit in a, in a city and how successful or efficiently it's running. The internal factors are about talking more specifically about the transit agency, um, how many routes they have, how much they pay their employees, you know, how, how efficient are they running as an agency, um, and then what's the level of service they're actually providing. I mean, if you have a very dense city but you're only providing a bus route one hour, you're not going to have a whole lot of transit ridership. Um, then there were the external factors, which I think we know here in Oregon and it's been shown other places that actually influence your transit ridership even more. Um, and that is how many, how many people live in a certain area, how many people live along your routes. Where are people going? Do they, is there a central place where everyone needs to go in the morning to get to work? Um, and then employment growth rates and, land, and residential or Population growth rates also impact. So those are the kind of factors I found to be most important. So for my study, I had to say, okay, I can't use them all. I mean, there's probably a, you know, a list of a thousand different factors, um, all of which could be used for this. But what I really wanted to see when I was looking at these transit agencies in small areas were these variables. I wanted to really know how big of an area are we even talking about um, and how many people live in those in that area. I really thought, because I was thinking what could be useful in Bend, I wanted to know what type of system, the size of the bus, how many routes, um, what kind of service is, being is currently being provided. And then I looked at population and land use characteristics, and these are the external factors. Uh, I wanted to know how many people were living in low-income households, how many people were, of minority, were minorities, were was there a lot of people who were elderly and needed 
and not a transportation alternative. And then the other thing that I found to be really important as I was looking at these case studies was how many people in this city are enrolled in college, whether it's graduate or undergraduate, whether they're traditional students or non-traditional students. Uh, it seemed to be a factor that influenced how many people rode the bus. Um, and then I wanted to know a little bit about how the city was using their land and thought that, for example, if, the, if it was free to park and there was a lot of parking downtown, there wouldn't be a whole lot of incentive for people to ride transit to work. Uh, so I wanted to look at these kind of things. The last one, average travel time, I wanted to see from 1990 to 2000 was, was there more congestion in the city. And then I did look at the performance measures. One of the things I had sought originally to look at was are there performance measures that are most important for transit in small cities? And I think one, due to the lack of kind of a comprehensive body of research on transit in small cities, and then two, because there may just not be um, specific performance measures that we need to be looking at for smaller agencies versus bigger ones. So these are pretty much the traditional ones you'll see if you look um, at any transit agency across the, uh, across the nation. So selection of cities. So how do you know what cities look like Bend? I mean, you can say, okay, I'm just going to pick a bunch of cities that are like Boulder and Aspen, a bunch of kind of skis towns, or you can say, oh, I'm just going to randomly pick a bunch of cities that are 50,000 people. But what I really wanted to see was how had transit developed in cities that were like Bend. I wanted to see if there was something we could say. So looking at what a city's doing right now doesn't tell me what's going to happen, what could possibly happen in Bend in 10 years. So what I did was I went through and found what cities were designated as their MPO in 1990, figuring that now I had 10 years to say this is what they had done with their transit over after they got their MPO designation and had received more federal funding possibly f to build their transit system. Um, so this was the city, the list of cities that I came up with. Uh, a pretty good mix of east and west, south and north. Uh, and there, actually in 1990, there were 37 urban areas that were designated as MPOs, but a lot of times what happened is it's something like Beaverton, and Beaverton grows to be big enough to an MPO, so they just lump it to Portland. And so what I chose here were the, st the 12 standalone MPOs. And after just a really brief review, three were knocked out almost immediately. They don't have transit in Brunswick, Georgia. There were too few uh, and buses in Fredericksburg, and th Fredericksburg is so close to D.C. that a lot of the D.C. transit is, is uh, serving that area, and the same with Hernando County, Florida. There were just too few buses to really have the data that I needed. So then looking at Bend and looking at the cities that I, the nine cities that I had that were MPOs in 1990, I've established these six um, population or evaluation criteria. I really thought that it was important that if the transit system was exactly the same as Bend, as Bend's, that it would be a really important one to look at. I was really more interested in a western city because of the land development um, patterns. And then I realized after, <laughs> I do need an Oregon example. So whether or not I have a 1990 MPO or a 1980 MPO, I needed to look to see how it was a city dealing not only with the federal designation, but also with the Oregon requirement and the transportation planning rule um, to develop their transit system. And I wanted to make sure there was enough publicly available information. This actually became a problem as I went through, but initially when I did started searching, this seemed, these agencies seemed to have plenty. So my case studies. So I had four, Holland, Michigan, Logan, Utah, Idaho Falls, Idaho, and then Medford, Oregon, which is the n city that actually became an MPO in 1980. Um, but again, like I said, due to the Oregon uh, planning rules, I wanted to make sure I had an Oregon example. And Medford is not so big now that it's un it was a bad one to choose. So Holland, Michigan, this was, uh, so they have a population of 60,000. They actually, there, it was Holland, Michigan, and then there were actually several cities around Holland that were included in their uh, MPO. So it was as unlike Bend in the sense that Bend is just the city. It's not any other cities next to it. But um, they had actually 13 members of their 
13 members on their MPO board, which I was, none of them were actually specifically a transit uh, representative, but at this point the city was representing their transit. Um, but they did have, they found a way to get around some of the politics that happen with MPOs because most of the time when MPOs you have this, the city, the center city will actually kind of sometimes dominate. And in this case they actually re removed some of that political power and they created an executive committee which was more um, kind of a think tank than um, a board of elected officials. And this I thought was interesting was that they actually received some private funding once they became an MPO which is unusual for the other cities that I looked at, um, specifically to develop their GIS, um, realizing the importance of GIS as you're looking at transportation and just regional planning in general. And one of the main reasons that I did look at Holland was because they had a dollar ride service when I started in 1990 that only served the city, which is exactly what is happening currently in Bend. Um, and but the MPO recognized almost immediately that this was not serving the needs of the region and in their first set of planning documents they said we need to figure out a way to expand our transit and six years later they actually did create their region-wide transit um, and, and they actually came out and said that most of the residents in the urban area are within this quarter mile walking distance of a bus stop um, I don't know if that's really on the street or not but uh, at least they did try to do that, um, but in addition, they continue to operate their demand response service. The next one was in Idaho Falls, and I really thought that Idaho would be an interesting example because uh, they don't have, it's so close, but they don't have the land use planning rules that we have here in Oregon, and that it could, in fact, be an example of maybe what we don't want our development patterns to look like, but maybe that their transit, they found a way to serve that type of development pattern with their transit. Um, and they originally had a nonprofit transit agency that was not originally represented, but then very soon after the MPO was designated, they put the nonprofit transit agency representative there. And then finally, when they created their actual public transit system, that person was then represented on their board. So they did, as a region, see that that was a priority to have the transit interest. And they have their funding from a bunch of different sources. And this year, um, they only got partial funding, so the next year it was more. Uh, so here they had no, as I said, they had no publicly provided transit when they became an MPO. And so basically they had a community kind of dial a ride social service system. Uh, but by 1998, they did pass a ballot, and they got their first routes. And right now, they have these four routes, but they're all f deviating in that they have these set stops at pretty much set times, but that this system at any time can respond to a call and go out, deviate from their actual route about three-quarters of a mile, and then come back and peop pick people up. Um, and they also are s providing just a demand response service. Logan, Utah. Uh, again, these guys, they're voting members. They had uh, Utah dot and Catch County, and then the they. But they did have a transit district when they started, so that person was represented there. But what they found initially, this was interesting, is that Utah, the state DOT in Utah, did not provide them enough funding. They were sort of keeping their packet of money. They didn't really want to share their money beyond Salt Lake City. And so the MPO was kind of constantly fighting with the state DOT to figure out how they can get their planning money, how they can get their planning money. Um, you can see 29000 is a lot less um, than would actually work to develop an MPO. So they had to be, they almost, the MPO was designated, but it wasn't really, didn't have a lot of kind of regional presence um, for a couple years. But they did have a full-blown transit district. So... Uh, but again, it was only serving within the within the city districts. Um, but in order to pay for their transit system, they were actually levying a, a sales tax, and so that is an opportunity to say, okay, so how are agencies funding their transit? Um, but finally, they were able to convince them. Oh, and then because they didn't have the money from Utah State DOT, they actually started using some of their planning money to to fund their, just their administrative tasks. So they weren't even using the money the right way because they didn't have it there. Um, 
and then finally they were able to get the money to do their transit plan and then look at their um, and expand their service. And then Medford. So these guys in 1980 actually had 52,000 people. Right away they had nine members and their transit agency had been in existence since 1975. They started running shuttles in 1977. So here the transit agency really predated um, or predated the MPO. And this is where I have a bunch of missing information. So this is where it led me to realize that I do need to go beyond just my secondary data sources and start talking with MPOs and the transit districts to figure out how they develop their system. But Unlike the other agencies where they didn't necessarily have a plan for what they wanted to do, because Medford was in Oregon, they were able to say, well, these are our priorities now that we're an MPO. And they really reflect pretty much the TPR priorities. And so um, I guess the TPR is working in one regard, that we have our MPOs thinking about these specific things. Um, but that was definitely a difference, um, this looking at the Oregon example versus the others. And so they have the fixed route transit. The interesting the thing about Rogue Valley is that none of their statistics are reported urban and then separated out of their rural. So it's hard to say really um, what's happening specifically in their MPO in the urban area. But again, it could be an opportunity um, for Ben to look and say, well, maybe we need to be serving just beyond Bend, and maybe Rogue Valley is a good example for that. So this was what I realized was that Logan, Utah has the most number of unlinked trips and they have the highest uh, trips per capita, unlinked trips per capita. And so they do have the highest ridership numbers. They have the most people in their region using transit. When I went back to look, I found out that a really large percentage of their population are enrolled at Utah State University. And so this it's a really direct relationship between um, the number of enrolled college students you have and your number of trips. Um, but if you look at the costs, it didn't seem so extravagant to me. I mean, I think the $8 per passenger trip seemed a little bit high out in Holland, Michigan, but um, it wasn't like we had $15 per passenger trip or something. It seemed pretty reasonable. And when I compared it to TriMet, it wasn't so far off. Um, in particular, you can see that in Utah, it's, uh, in Logan, it's closer to what's going on with TriMet. Um, but the number of unlinked passenger trips per capita is much higher here in Oregon. Um, so what I did find, and this is the specific thing when I was looking at, is what's going on, what are the transit agencies doing to serve their particular agents, their particular constituency. And I was disappointed to find out that their systems kind of look just like every other system. They they're have a pretty, you know, they're operating about 12 hours a day, or they're op operating for kind of the main part of the day, um, but they're not really running buses very frequently, maybe once or twice an hour, um, and they're using the full-size buses. And So I was a little bit disappointed to find that out. Um, but what I did find so far was that if... Um, a transit agency has something, a dial-a-ride service, they could have high ridership numbers, um, or they don't, I guess they have more than. Um, but what I did find when you compare Holland to at least Idaho Falls that had no fixed route transit or any kind of public transit at the beginning, that they're still not doing as well. So some kind of system in the beginning is better than none, but the Rogue Valley and the Logan Transit District that had a district when they started is actually doing better. Um, the costs do vary. So these were some of my initial conclusions and this is where the public participation part starts because um, this is where I'm trying to figure out how I can and what I can go next. Um, what I was disappointed when I found out that no one's doing anything really innovative, that they're not running taxis or they're not running shuttle, you know, they're not running small buses, they're running the full-size buses along fixed routes and a lot of times they're empty. And so that didn't seem to me to be the way that I, it wasn't what I was hoping to find. Um, but the one thing that's interesting is that the Logan system is a fareless system, and they're the ones with the highest ridership. So I wonder if you could somehow say, 
I don't know how you would do this, but is it because the system is fairless that they have such high ridership, or is it because they have um, the high college population? So would a fairless system be something to look at for Bend? Um, colleges are great for ridership. Um, but overall, the level of service is pretty low. Um, in small cities, people still have to plan their trips. They can't say, oh, I'm just going to go jump on the bus right now and go meet my friends or whatever it is. They do have to say, well, the bus doesn't come until five minutes after the hour, so I can't be where I need to be until 35 minutes after the hour. Um, and that's not an ideal situation for increasing your ridership. Um, and that generally I found out that I needed to get more it, uh, information from the transit agencies and from the cities to specifically see how um, their MPO and their transit agency were working together. So here's some of my next steps. Um, I really need to look more specifically at some of the population and the employment densities. Um, maybe it's, it's more than just um, the college population in Utah that's keeping people on the bus. Maybe it is a lot more dense in places in Logan than, than, I, than I know. Or maybe there is a really big um, employment center that's, that's bringing everyone there other than the, than the university. I really didn't look at how agencies were funding their transit. Um, it could be that the funding that they're getting either from the state or from the federal government is kind of dictating what kind of system they need to have and it's not allowing them to use money to do something more innovative. Um, I, when I went from the nine MPOs down to the four, I had an opportunity to look at five additional MPOs and so maybe that's what I need to do next to figure out if there's any kind of innovative things going on with those agencies. Uh, and one of the questions that actually I got asked and I haven't been able to answer is what did prompt the MPO or the transit agency to move to a more expansive service? Was it just that they realized, oh, there's more people here and they're saying that we have to do it? Was there a champion? Um, was there a huge demand that had said, you know, made them increase their service? Those are questions I'm just not really sure. And what happened in Idaho Falls, I didn't mention this, but I was supposed to when I was going through, but that in 1990, Idaho Falls actually had a 15.5% mode split for transit. So 50,000 people and 15% of them are riding the bus to work. Ten years later, only 5% of them are riding the bus to work, and they had 70,000 people. So something happened in Idaho Falls that drastically changed their mode split. Maybe it was just an accounting error. I'm not sure. But, or, uh, a math error with the census, but uh, I really want to go back and see, did they lose a huge employer or did they sort of, did their density or their uh, residential density go a lot lower once they became the MPO? Did they have a lot of suburban style development in the city? I'm not really sure. And then finally I want to make recommendations for Bend. Um, and I think that uh, opportunity for further study, as I mentioned, is really to see what incentives or disincentives exist, whether from the federal government or from the state governments, that would encourage um, cities to do something innovative. I mean, is there something in the funding that says, okay, well now you're an MPO and you have this pocket of capital money available to you, and the only way you can get that capital money is if you buy 10 full-size buses and run them on fixed routes. I mean, I don't think that it's that specific, but could it be that there are some kind of unintentional um, incentives in the funding um, coming from the federal government? Or is it just that fixed route transit is where we see all of these cities needing to go, um, and so we're going to just start it now and wait for the development to come in? So that's it. I really hope you guys have some questions and ideas for me so I can keep working on this paper. Michael, go ahead. Um, I kind of a quick two-parter. Um, kind of a quick two-parter. <laughs> um, and it revolves around the issue of the fact that, as you probably know as well as anyone, uh, Bend, as well as being a growing metropolitan area, is also still a major resort destination. So a lot of the people who are clogging up the roads and maybe necessitating public transit are actually visitors. And so my question is, um, how central of an issue uh, do you see this resort type activity being in a consideration of transit? Like, what, how big of an issue is that? And if you do think it's a big issue, 
Um, do you think that it would lead to a lot of uh, political impalability for, uh, for it to actually happen because a lot of residents would say, why should we pay to, pay to have move them. visitors right. around? You know? I think it is an issue. I think right now it's not a, a real visible issue. I mean, I think you see it more, this is just my opinion, being there is you see it more like at the restaurants and when you want to be get in line or go do something event, you don't necessarily see it on your work commute, if you will. So I think that there's an opportunity, maybe in terms of safety and things like that, to move people up to the mountain and back. Um, but I don't know. I think it's going to be a growing issue, and it's another reason to f to do transit. But I think that it would benefit residents, even if they got some of those tourists off the road, because then they would be able. One, it would be people who who know the area or don't know the area wouldn't be creating havoc, but also would you know just free up road space and those kinds of things. But I think the city sees the resort and the recreation as such an economic kind of engine for them that to make that argument would be kind of I think half sided maybe. We don't want to pay a transit boat. Come here and spend your money, you know, so maybe there's a balance there. Mm -hmm. But it is something I've thought about and I originally wanted to to look at resort towns to figure out how they were doing transit and so I think there's an opportunity for some of that kind of transit of in Bend as part of a larger system for sure. Next question, Dan. Are you gonna look at um what the size of the transit district or transit system ought to be? For instance, should it encompass Redmond, Sisters, Lapine, right. those types of things? Um, I think for this I was just looking specifically at the, at the MPO boundaries. Um, I think that in order to provide a really good system in Bend, you would want to at least have some of the, um, from Redmond, Sisters, Lapine, definitely from the airport for sure. Um, but I don't know if they would be if they would, they would be part of the city system or they would just kind of be spurs or offshoots of that central sort of circulating system. Um, I think that the cities around Bend are being, at least most recently when I've talked to people, are trying to make concerted efforts to not be bedroom communities to Bend. And so um, connections like that to Bend are lower on their priority list than maybe, you know, a regional kind of identity. But I think if with the MPO, the city has the opportunity to say, we really do need to make this regional. Um, and we do need to say, this MPO could be bigger in a couple years. Maybe we need to be looking further like that. But I think they need to include it in the system. And that's why I was trying to see, for example, in the Logan in Utah, what they did do was say, OK, now they have these county routes that have been added to their system. And I think we could do, you could have some Deschutes County routes that would make, that would make a lot of sense. Mike? Um, this isn't a suggestion, but I guess more a sort of your, your opinion or if you have ideas about it. You keep talking about the college population using, using transit so much. So I'm assuming then that these students are graduating, finding jobs, buying cars, and quit using transit. So if, I guess it's a larger transit issue overall, but just in your study, have you looked at or do you have any ideas of how to keep those people using transit once they get out of college? Don't have any ideas. I, mean, I don't know. I mean, I think, one, keeping those graduates in the city would be one thing, but that would be a whole kind of jobs development issue. Um, so I'm not really sure. I haven't looked at it. But I think that is a further study right there. <laughs> That's right. Thank you. Go ahead. Kind of along those lines, you mentioned that the college population is a good indicator of transit ridership. <clears throat> Did you find anything, like, in your lit review or anywhere else uh, relating to the proportion of the service industry and the economy and how that affects transit ridership? It seemed like that would be pretty important in Bend and in other places as well, generally. I think that it, it definitely impacts sort of the people who would, who would have a demand for transit. But if you're coming from a lot of different places, going to a lot of different places, as you do, I mean, service sector one tend to be really mobile if you think about house cleaning and landscaping and those kinds of things. There's not one point really to drop people off. Um, and the other is is that they tend to be coming again from all these different locations. And so if there were a way to do something with employers to make it more, 
you know, the employers running shuttles or something like that, that would work. But it's, um, though there's a demand there, but the destination and uh, origin destination is a little bit more difficult. So, but I have thought about it. I mean, I know that there's a demand. I'm just not sure how you would build transit around that specifically. So, and none of the other cities that I looked at so far have anything that I've found has said this is what we've done to provide transit for our service kind of employees. Rob? I was wondering, this, may, this is a future research thing, but I, you talked about dial-a-ride separate from fixed route, and um, I think we've talked before about this transit taxi concept that would improve this sort of one-hour headway, especially in the off-peak, especially for people who are working odd hours. Are you going to pursue that, or have you given any thought how mm -hmm. those sort of connecting the dial-a-ride with the fixed route would maybe be appropriate or not? And I think that's what I was looking for. I wanted to see if any cities were doing that or even thinking about it in their service plans. Um, I think there's definitely room for it, um, especially when you have the service industry that's operating maybe at less regular hours. Um, but I haven't seen any examples of it. And I think that it's, for this one, I was trying to find what are other cities currently doing that could be used in Bend. I think what I'm finding is that I don't know if I want to use what any of these cities are. Um, but, I mean, it's not up to me necessarily, but I think that looking for those innovations. The problem is they're not really happening in the United States thus far, and we need to go to other countries. <laughs> this leads to my, my other question about um, expanding to an international view, viewpoint. Right. I guess, I'm not sure. I mean, then my thinking was that it would be easiest for Ben to look at what other cities are doing, how they got their funding, and how they use that funding to do specifically X, Y, and Z, that as soon as I expand further than that, that that sort of model issue isn't as applicable. So, but I think it's useful. Go, ahead, Justin. Yes. Um, I'm. I'm. I, it occurs to me that uh, in a small city, you might have some different patterns of what people are using transit for, as far as each trip is concerned. And do you have any insights or information on how the demographics or the layout of Bend or any of these other places might be affecting that? That's actually then when I talked about the things I still want to do is look at this residential density and the employment density um, to figure out what what would be some of the likely travel patterns. Um, that would be useful to look at for the other cities to see if they have travel patterns that would be similar. Um, the one that's obvious and I kind of keep harping on is this kind of movement to and from the university, which seems to be a big piece. But um, in Bend, they have a large employer, the hospital, and they're actually working to build kind of a medical district. And so I could definitely see that being a way, one destination that you could kind of start to develop some transit around. Um, but I haven't seen that example specifically in other cities. So, But the travel pattern piece is huge um, for sure. Thanks. Have you, <coughs> excuse me, have you compared the uh, levels of ridership in cities, larger cities that have fareless systems uh, with smaller systems so that you could assess the relative increase uh, attributable to fareless systems, which you could then apply to the smaller cities? Um, I haven't for this study, but in other research that there aren't a whole lot of large city systems that run fareless systems. For, I think primarily due to all the negative impacts that come with having a fareless system, joy riding, and people just riding to keep out of the rain, these kinds of things. Um, so I haven't looked at larger city systems. The, um, most of the fareless systems that I've come across have been in cities smaller than 50,000. Um, so I'm not really. It would be a great idea if, it, if, it, if I could find an example to look at, for sure. Jennifer. I would speculate that one of the reasons for that is because once it, at the smaller scale your ridership is so low that the fares aren't contributing enough mm -hmm. to your budget that it sometimes isn't worth collecting right. in, a, in a sense and in a larger system that so potentially it's a bigger source of revenue and that's maybe one of the reasons that the small systems look to that. Right. Go ahead. Um, are you going to look at the possible effects of uh, incentive programs for employees that uh, businesses might be using in other cities that have 
transit. Like, for instance, St. Charles Medical Center has an employee um, participation plan already for using, you know, carpooling or riding your bike or walking. Um, what effects do you think you might find that that would have on ridership? I think I really want to look at it in terms of funding because usually when there's some kind of program, so if it's St. Charles or whatever it is, they're saying, okay, we're going to give free passes to our employees and we're just going to pay this set amount every year. And so what I would like to see from the cities that I've looked at is what kind of, kind of pass programs do they have and how much of that funding is part of their operating and then looking to see if, they, if there was an estimate of ridership from that funding. So that was my way of kind of trying to get at that kind of those shared costs funding piece. Yeah. Does the state of Oregon provide any sort of funding to start uh, transit systems in small communities? So they have the same kind of type of funds that every state does. There are specific pots of money for non-urban areas. And so that's a lot of, a lot of the cities in Oregon that are running non-transit in non-urban areas are using this pot of money. It's not huge and it's, um, I don't know, really. So it's, but once they become an urban area, there's more funding. And can you answer that, Dan? What are you going to say? Yeah, just to follow up on that, uh, ODOT does provide um, the city of Bend with federal funds that are available. Also, the, um, the local highway division out there, Region 4, also sets aside some of its funds for transit in Bend and the Deschutes County area as well. But it's, it's not a lot. John? I was just curious. You were uh, calling down your list of comparable cities to four. When I was looking at that initial list, I was thinking Flagstaff seemed similar to Bend in my mind. And I was wondering the reason for not including that. Was it like a, not enough data? or? The Flagstaff actually became an MPO in 1996. They did their own mid-year or mid-five-year, whatever, 1995 census so that they could become an MPO. So there isn't the 10-year time period that I was looking at. But I think now that I've looked at it, I need to go back. I think I automatically also eliminated them because I knew that Arizona State University was there. I didn't know about Utah State when I started. So, um, But I think at this point it makes sense to go back and look at that. But I agree with you for sure. I apologize. I came in late, so this okay. question might be off the mark. But what about... Um, did you investigate any uh, jeepney services, uh, especially between cities like Redmond and Bend, and the possibility of the, the success of those? I didn't for this. I was looking specifically at um, transit in, I guess, public transit run by cities. I didn't really look. But had there been a jeepney service that had been contracted as part of that public system, then I would have investigated it, but I didn't come across any. And I think a little bit to my disappointment, I was hoping to find some things like that that would be elements of a possible system that could be useful. Any other questions? Okay. Well, with that, thank you very much, Carolyn.